Part 1, Chapter 6, Lotus The sky had grown cloudy, and with it came an expected apathy. The smell of coming rain created a peaceful billow in my lungs and a yearning for warm food in my belly. Dreary weather was a double-edged sword for me. I relished in the cold and gray, that feeling of a dead world stuck in abstract isolation, poetic and inspiring, yet at the same time, it never failed to drag up disruptive remembrance. After all, the world was frozen when everything had fallen away from me. I boarded the bus, little fireflies of positivity still fluttering in my skull from a not-so-terrible day. That fluttering turned to acid the moment I saw Stacy sitting up front of the bus. I nearly halted entirely out of shock, considering she didn't ride this bus home. She was sitting alone, which meant she wasn't likely going to a friend's house. Besides, her brother usually drives her everywhere. I slowed down enough to glance down at what she was focused on, a big block of text on her flip phone. She either didn't notice me or ignored my presence. Either way, I moved along. When I found my seat as far from her as I could, I nestled in against the wall and took stock of the boarding students. Less than typical. Two girls I knew by name but was not acquainted with. This guy named Cameron who asked me on a date once. I said no because I barely knew him and I assumed it was a prank of some sort. He then went to his guy friends and said I asked him out and they all made fun of me. Still do to this day. Then there was a boy sitting alone. His dark long hair drooped past his neck, and from here, he looked to be a statue with how still he was. I dropped my eyes to my knees and let my mind roam when the bus started moving. Near the end of math, Tansu had been taken by the guidance counselor. Apparently, Principal Wellard had some questions about her first day, and she was going to wait in the office for her mother to come by and pick her up. Tansu, what an odd girl. I couldn't shake this bubble in my chest sweet and sour at the same time, intrigue and caution. I wonder if she will even remember me by tomorrow. In twenty long minutes, my distant thoughts were interrupted by the familiar sight of trees as we turned down my road. I watched my driveway go by and started to pay more attention when we took the next right and entered the new strip of pavement. A quarter mile down this way, we turned left, only to immediately turn right to enter a private community just sent Avenue. I sat up fully and looked out my window to see a house on the left, flat roof by design, but still fairly large. Directly across was another two-story house with a nicely trimmed hedge out front and a white picket fence protecting their grass. The bus pulled past these two houses and then turned slightly right into the large parking lot for the community playground. They had a tennis court, basketball hoops, soccer nets, and plenty of other stuff for kids to play on all packed tightly in the corner of this place, surrounded by a dense forest. There were many houses here, all separated by neat lawns and fences, like a whole other world less than two miles from my condemned hut. I never paid attention before, because I never cared. It was all just background noise, but now it had relevance. The bus turned around and we headed back the way we came. Soon after, we stopped in front of my driveway, and I stepped out onto the dirt. It was hard to explain, but as I jogged towards my house after such a long and genuinely satisfying day, I had this sinking pit in my gut that it would somehow be ruined. I could almost taste the negativity steaming out of the front door, palpable and toxic. Nothing new, but harshly potent today. Almost contradictive. I saw his car in the driveway and started to manage my expectations. I got to the door and jiggled the handle. Locked. I sighed, then proceeded to knock loudly a few times. Almost three entire minutes later, I heard the locks click and slide. Then the door swung open, revealing my dad in all of his five o'clock shadow, tank top wearing, beer gut glory. Hey, I greeted him with a fake smile. It was very apparent by the way his head wobbled like a fishing lure and how his eyes seemed to stare straight through me that he wasn't in his right mind. A burp was caught in his teeth, and he swayed. Oh, Kimberly, where have you been all day? He slurred. School, Dad. Where else? He half-scratched his chin. Oh, yeah. 
I was almost entertained by a stupor, if it weren't for my defenses being raised and my skin tightening with angst. He squinted and gave an almost offended grunt before gripping my bicep tightly. What are you standing there for? Get inside. He dragged me in harshly, letting me establish my footing as he shut the door and relocked it. I stood awkwardly, wanting to rub the soreness from my arm after he let go, but knew if I showed weakness, he would only chide me for it. The stench of booze had seeped into his clothes and whatever fabric he hovered around all day. I felt sick all at once, and quickly reassigned assets of my brain to get away from the situation as soon as possible. It took him nearly a minute to engage the locks, but once he had finished, he turned around and blankly stared at me. My body heat started to rise, and a tightness formed in my shoulders. A stinging zap pinched behind my eyes, and bottled up irritancy stirred in my throat. I swallowed it, resting slightly narrow eyes on him as I carefully removed my shoes. I set them aside as close to the door as I could without getting within his reach. All the while, he just looked at me like my face was backward. I didn't get a chance to slip away before the question started. What did you do today? His jaw slanted and his eyes started to get wet. He rubbed them and grunted softly, then straightened himself out. I answered, not giving him much emotion back, but just enough to not come off as rude or anything. Just an average day of school. Are you doing all your work? He stuttered. I scoffed. It was transparently obvious he didn't actually care about my day, not by the look in his eye. There were no lights on, no sense of who he was. Don't worry, you won't have to deal with any heat from my teachers. I'm still averaging A's and B's. I explained with a tired droll. Good. Your mother would fucking kill me if I raised a stupid kid. He wandered away from the door and found a new place to stand in front of the open fridge. The contents jingled on the door and he then slammed it tight, returning to the living room with two fresh beers in hand. A loud sigh and mumbling groan filled the space as he sat down on the couch. I remained where I was placed arms dangling by my side and eyes tracking his every movement, anticipating. The more I watched his empty movements, the angrier I started to get, more ashamed and filled with spiteful pity. I sucked air through my teeth, and my fingers started to curl and flex. My bones felt rigid, and all I could think about was every time he treated me like dirt in this state. Focused. Everything else non-existent. And then I receded. I felt my body start to relax, and I took my chance. I'm going to go study for a little bit, I stated, and he stared blankly at the television. I didn't give him any time to interject and slyly passed by, stopping only briefly to give a final look at the corner. The chilled can in his hand dripped condensation onto his leg while the other drink waited patiently on the coffee table. I watched him slowly dig a fingernail under the tab and then stop. His bloodshot eyes absorbed the mind-numbing properties of the flashing static, putting him in a trance that lasted for a long, quiet time. Then, to my surprise, he sighed and set the unopened can on the edge of the table next to him. His chin rested in his hand, kept up by his elbow that dug into the arm of the couch. Incredible sadness swept the room, and in an instant, I wanted to cry for him. Empathy. Something I don't reserve for many people, for fear of manipulation. But I couldn't deny that sliver I saved just for him, when I could truly see the man I knew as my father underneath all that crap. I knew what was on his mind. It was on mine, too. Should I speak out? Offer my metaphorical hand to relate and bleed together? Maybe he would open up. Maybe he would allow serenity to befall him alongside me. I wanted that. But it wasn't in me to try. Not anymore. That sympathy has failed and wounded me far too many times. With heavy soles, I tiptoed up the stairs and entered my bedroom, ready to make it my prison for the night. With the door shut and my bag dropped, I indulged in the damning repetition. Every day, the same thing, over and over. 
Go to school and get bullied. Come home and walk on glass. Go to my room and wait the night out. Sleep, wake, do it all over again. I have nothing apart from the creativity of my mind. No distractions or toys, no bonds to hold or outlets to release this agony. Looking around, this safe box I coddle is equally a vicious chamber of torture. Most of my individuality-defining items have been lost, broken, discarded, or buried in the confines of these tender shadows. Each thing I cherished brought little relief when compared to the ire they emitted. My teeth grit. At least I met someone new today. The thought of Tansu transitioned around to Joey. What came to mind looking around my room was the last time he was in here. It must have been this past summer when my dad was out all day doing some manly job in the next town over. I promised him I would stay home and clean the house, and I did. But I got a phone call that afternoon that required all of me. Joey was a wreck. The stress of his home life, his job, school, and everything got to him, and he needed me. He needed only me. I let him come over, and I distracted him by digging through some of my old things. Toys that we used to play with together during daycare. Old drawings and coloring books, and then we listened to the CD player he got me a long time ago. I ended up holding him while he cried, which was new for me. Even when his sister got sick two years ago, I never saw him shed a single tear. Not for lack of want, but for the sake of simply being strong. Portraying composure. And I admired that, but definitely told him how stupid I thought it was to hide his feelings. Hypocritical, even. That's the closest we've been in almost ten years, and we don't talk about it. That was the first time I really let my boundaries lapse. My room looked exactly the same now as it did back then. It was bland. He gave me a lot of crap for how dull my room was, and I agree. Hardly any color or personality, but it's not entirely my fault. I don't own much. I wish I had money so that I could buy some decorations. I could see it clearly. String lights, posters, a deep blue rug, and new wallpaper. Maybe a lava lamp or glow-in-the-dark stars to stick to my ceiling. Childish? Maybe. But I don't care. I smiled at the thought. A desire for nostalgia tickled my gut, and with a gentle prance, I made my way over to my closet. Inside, I was met with a small stack of boxes on the floor. Near the very bottom was the one I needed, so with carefully applied strength and dexterity, I lifted the others in one small pillar and used my feet to slide the desired shoebox out from underneath. The stack rested again on the cold floor, and the prize was mine. The lid came off easily and was tenderly placed to the side. I sat on the floor, crisscross position, and started to dig through it. A few drawings I did as a kid were there, but once those were out of the way, I found much better mementos. Just beneath the art, I pulled out a birthday card. The image on the front was that of a fire truck. The phrase, with letters formed from water shooting out of the hose, said, I hope your sixth birthday is on fire. I never understood this card. Why would a fire truck want my party to be on fire? Its only purpose is to put out fires, which means whoever came up with this card didn't get paid enough to be creative. On the inside of the card was a little note written in crayon. It was mostly indecipherable besides the person's name that signed it. Joey N. Memories of that day were almost non-existent. I vaguely recall a gathering of kids including Joey, Stacy, Needy's sister Daniela, two boys, Will and Luke, and another girl whose name I believe was Marcy, but that could be wrong. Will, Luke, and Marcy were just kids my mom watched on occasion, so they were only there for cake and games. I didn't blame them. I lovingly set the card down and continued my search. The next thing I lingered on was a rock with a smoky quartz gem in the middle. I found it on a field trip back in fifth grade. After that, it was a tiny plastic treasure chest with my first tooth inside. It never really occurred to me how weird it was to keep lost teeth, but this orange plastic chest made it feel important, so keep it, I will. 
All these things stirred snapshots of my little life and gave me a warm spot in my chest, but none came close to the feeling the last item created. At the bottom of the box, I rediscovered a little ball of cloth. I delicately lifted it out and placed it on my lap. Using as little force as I could, I unwrapped the cloth and newspaper that acted as protective layers. Inside was a palm-sized glass unicorn. The body was thick, but the legs and horn were incredibly thin and fragile. Clear as crystal and refracting the seeping window light peering from my left side, I rotated it part way and held it up with a glare piercing through. It was almost glowing, outlined by thin shadows and given new life. This memory was the most powerful. Christmas morning, around eight years ago, I was sitting on the floor in my pajamas at the foot of the tree, sobbing. My dad was in his usual spot on the couch, feeling powerless and lost alongside me. The entire day had been filled to the brim with sorrow and regret, and there was no changing that. Not even the most wonderful time of the year could hope to penetrate the pain. Laid out before me were a select few presents beneath the tree, just waiting to be opened, unaware of the recent tragedy that befell our family. I could still see them, even now. All the bright flashing lights and complimenting colors. I didn't have the strength to move. Hell, it took all my dad's convincing to get me out of bed and down the stairs. After a long, long time, he stood up from the couch. Without saying a single word, he began opening my presents and placing them next to me. Plastic dolls, VHS tapes, my own ornament to hang on the tree. Some pretty blue ribbons and nail polish, bubbles, and clothes. All wonderful gifts for my young self to receive, but nothing got through. Nothing broke my empty stare. Not until the very last one. He placed himself in front of me and crouched down. I looked up with bloodshot, wet eyes, and he presented me with a small red box secured by a tight ribbon. Sweetie, out of all your gifts, you have to open this one yourself. I remember him saying. I did. Inside the little box was this very unicorn. I didn't think much of it then, or even care, until I read the folded piece of paper inside. A handwritten note. Kiki, this little guy belonged to my mother and was given to me when I was a young girl. I promised her that I would hand this down to my own child, and that I would also pass along the same message. A unicorn will only reveal itself to those with a pure heart and an open mind. When you find it, follow it, and it will lead you to happiness. I ask that you carry this treasure and spread love and kindness to others, so that they too can find their own unicorn. Love, Mom. That was my first Christmas without her. That was her last gift to me. I let this memory play on repeat for a few minutes, watching the light from my ceiling pass through and refract the glass as I face the closet again. I tried to pry those feelings free, but nothing came. Numb, buried, abandoned. Only acidic writhing without a name slithered in tight coils between every muscle. As quickly as it was found, it was rewrapped and hidden away. The box was shoved back into the darkness, just like the memories of her. I looked around my room again. The air had a new feeling of renewal, in a sense. Strangely, I circled around to Tansu's face. Her voice, the shyness, the underlying eagerness. I want to know more about her. She made me feel different today. Alive, in a way I thought was long gone. It may be silly to have such a strong emotion after one encounter, but I can't quite explain it. I'm going to try to get to know her. After a few minutes, I set my backpack on the bed and started unpacking it. I went over the homework I was assigned in my head, 
reading two chapters in the textbook for science class and one Spanish translation sheet. It was a light load, which would allow me time to organize my bag. Once I would finish that, maybe I would try drawing again. It's been a while, and I have about 15 unfinished sketches that needed some shading and detail. Partway through unloading books, I heard a crunching noise. Shifted to the side by the open zipper, it was a medium-sized bag of pretzels, the bag Joey bought me for lunch. I took it out and held it in both hands, thinking about the short interaction. I didn't really appreciate it then, but now that I'm essentially bound to my bedroom for the night, I couldn't be more grateful. I wouldn't have to go to bed hungry again.